So good afternoon, everyone. I am Anthony Vega, president of OWTV, which includes OWTV interns, OWTV News Club, along with the Student Media Club. Thank you for joining us today for our Black History Month event, a conversation with Black media professionals navigating issues of race in the business. It's an honor for my clubmate tonight to host you today. And we have a short video of the OWTV studio and club for you. And now we will introduce our current club members, starting with me. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Vega, president of OWTV and OWTV News. Next, we have Alexa. Hi, I'm Alexa Spinelli. I am vice president of OWTV and OWTV News. Next, Hi. we have Amber. Hi, I'm Amber Green. I'm the secretary of OWTV and OWTV News. And lastly, we have Nina. Hi, my name is Nina Crawford. I'm PR for the OWTV and OWTV News. Our club is open to all students from every major as long as you're interested in media production. We meet every Thursday during common hour from 2.40 to 3.50 p.m. on Zoom. Anyone who is interested in joining can contact us at OWTVnews at oldwestbury.edu and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Also, we will put our Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok handles in the chat box. Please subscribe and follow us to see what we are up to. And without further ado, I will pass this on to my secretary, Amber Green. Amber, you're on mute. We have a fantastic panel for you today, including Emmy Award-winning journalist, Jackie Reed, and two Old Westbury alums who are also holding their own. But first, we will introduce our faculty advisors who will help us moderate the event. Dr. Oz Atgon, a professor in the American Studies Media and Communications Department, and manager of the Media Innovation Center, which houses the OWTV studios and offers students internships and the ability to learn and produce media content. And Lisa Payton, a professor in the American Studies Media and Communications Department. Professor Payton is the faculty advisor for OWTV News, which includes teaching students how to write and produce news packages, as well as overseeing a monthly news show. She is also an independent journalist and television writer. We also would like to recognize our college administrators who have joined us today. Dr. Timothy Sams, President of SUNY College at Old Westbury, Dr. Duncan Corliss, Vice Provost, and Dr. Amanda Friskin, Dean of Arts and Sciences, and all other faculty. Thank you for joining us. Professor Payton will introduce our panelists. Hi, everybody. We have such an esteemed panel. I'm going to start with their bios. I'm going to introduce Stanley Talbert first. <clears throat> Stanley Talbert is an associate producer for CNN Tonight with Don Lemon. He works alongside senior writers and producers to bring important stories to air particularly those that focus on social justice. Prior to joining CNN, Stanley worked as a production assistant and a teleprompter operator at ABC News for various shows, including World, World News Now, Nightline, Good Morning, and Good Morning America. He graduated with honors in 2019 from SUNY College at Westbury with a degree in media and communications, where uh, while here, Stanley won a number of MAC awards, executive produced the OWTV News Club, and was an intern for OWTV. Okay, next up is Miss Selena Hill. Selena Hill is an award-winning writer, 
on-air personality, live event host, commentator, and content creator with a passion for empowering marginalized communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. She currently is the digital editor for Black Enterprise, where she covers entrepreneurship, race, culture, and politics. She also conducts on air camera interviews with celebrities and business luminaries like Wendy Williams, Spike Lee, and Stacey Abrams. Pretty impressive. Selena also created Be Heard Talk, a radio show and podcast that focuses on race, politics, and culture. Uh, she received the New York Association of Black Journalists Award for Best Blog Commentary. She also received the Presidential Medal Award when she graduated from SUNY College at Old Westbury in 2009 with a degree in media and communications. And last but definitely not least, long, uh, Ms. Jackie Reed, longtime Emmy Award uh, winning journalist Jackie Reed is a leading voice in media. She co-hosts on NBC4's lifestyle and entertainment shows New York Live and The Hub Today. Reed's talents have landed her on some of the most esteemed platforms, such as The View, CNN Headline News, BET Nightly News, the nationally syndicated Tom Joyner Show, where I used to listen to her all the time, and more. When Reed is not dishing out the latest news or interviewing celebrities, she's giving her followers useful tips to live out their best lives. Reed is the creator and president of Vegan Sexy Cool. Brand, which is a resource that shows her subscribe, subscribers how to thrive with plant-based eating and an overall vegan lifestyle. Okay, let's show you a little bit about what they do. What is your secret to a great interview? Some of those tips that you are giving throughout this whole project. Um, I mean, look, it's all based off of understanding you. Senator Harris, it is no secret that you are being seen as the clear front runner. We've come a long way and we still have a long way to go by the same time we're making progress. What happened on Wednesday at the Capitol was about preserving whiteness. That's what this is about. This is the tough conversation that we must have. Live from Chicago, it's Jackie Reed. <laughs> well, the new series turns blind dating into an extreme sport. Oh, I'm vegan, so I love vegan food. And today, we're going on a tour of vegan restaurants and places in Brooklyn. Journalism, especially in news, it's almost an everyday occurrence that you'll run into a story that just tugs at your heartstrings. Great, let's welcome our panel if we can. <laughs> yes, wow. Okay, Oz. It is already so exciting. So um, I just wanna explain how we will move forward. We will start by alternating our questions between our students and the faculty moderators. But uh, we would also like to hear from um, our attendees. If you have any questions, uh, please use the chat uh, box to share your questions with us. And if you would like to ask your own questions, please indicate on as part of the uh, question so that we understand you want to ask your own question. Or if you put off, we would consider that as one of our students will be reading out the question for you. And we will do our best to uh, respond to all the questions, but the questions will be on the first come, first serve basis. And hopefully uh, we will try our best to cover as many questions as possible. Um, if if every, everyone is ready to go, let's start with Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Atkin. Now, my first question that we have here is from the student's point of view. Uh, this is for each of our panelists. We all want to be as successful as you when we graduate. Can you tell us briefly about your start and about that job that now looking back, you know was your big break? Uh, let us start with Ms. Jackie Reed. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Hey everybody. So my first job was straight out of school um, and it was a one station market um, in Brunswick, Georgia. And one station market means usually and, you know, at that time, there was no cable news. So there was an ABC, NBC, CBS affiliate really in every uh, city. Um, and in this particular uh, area, Brunswick, Georgia, that is where I got my first job and they only had one station. Um, and it was considered a CNN affiliate, meaning that a lot of our national feeds and things like that we got from CNN, but it was definitely a local station. So that was my big break. Um, it was an opportunity for me to not just be a reporter, which was what I was hired to do, but to also, um, you know, 
dabble in anchoring and also do some live shots. They didn't have the best equipment at the time for going live, but I did have an opportunity to do that. And it really was satisfying for me to get that job two months after I graduated from school. Um, because for a lot of young people, and I say this when I talk to young people, when you graduate, it can be easy to, it's easier, I think, in a lot of cases to find a job that's not in media or is not what you want to do in media. And I really encourage, encourage young people to try to lean into working in media if you can't find something that's exactly what you want to do, because finding a job at a bank or a job, you know, somewhere else, you'll get used to making that money, right? And your lifestyle will adjust to making that money because there's not a lot of money in this business, particularly when you start out as glamorous as it may seem, as glamorous as it may seem, it is not that way. Um, so you can get caught up in making a certain amount of money, having weekends off, you know, having evenings off. You can get in that routine and you get further and further away from what you're passionate about and what you really want to do. So I was very lucky and very blessed to find a job right after I graduated. Um, and, you know, and here I am just a few years later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Selena. Yes, let me first off say thank you so much, Lisa and the OWTV um, committee for just putting together this event. I'm having like a lot of nostalgic memories come back. I see Professor Friskin in the audience, um, Miss Cynthia Anderson, um, Professor Archer, Professor Grossman, um, so many of, you know, the old Westbury alum that have really helped cultivate my career, hone my skills, and really just set me up for success. Like, I'm literally almost teary-eyed um, just to reconnect with you guys. Like, Old West Bay holds such a, a deep and special place in my heart. You know, it's, it's a small school, but it's filled with a lot of love, um, passion, and resources if you take advantage of them. And, you know, the thing that Lisa didn't read in my bio is that the show that I do now, Be Her Talk, is the show I started as a first year student at OWWR because of Dr. Friskin and Miss Anderson. They saw something in me. I, I wanted to be a writer. I joined the newspaper, um, the newspaper um, back at OS Bay. And I guess they saw something in me and they were like, you should start a radio show for the first year experience. And I was like, okay. And I started it. And literally, like, after, I guess, like, a few weeks, they were like, you know what, Selena, this is your thing, take it and run with it. And I did. And I did it for years out of Westbury. We won Mac Awards. I took a two-year hiatus. And now Stanley Fritz, who is also an alum out of Westbury, he and I have still been working on this show professionally. And we've had everyone on the show from Senator Cory Booker to Mayor Bill de Blasio. And it is literally my heart and passion. And it's, again, it is, it speaks to old Westbury. Like you, like I just want to, you know, take a time to really speak to the students because you have the world in your hands. You literally have, you know, great professors, alum and committees. You're making lifelong friends and creating so many experiences. And, you know, I could not be prouder to be from old Westbury. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Selena. So fantastic. We're so proud of you. We talk about you all the time. So just so you know. Okay, uh, Stanley? Hello, everyone. Um, also, piggyback off the Selena said, I'm also proud to be here. I'm also very thankful to be here without the help of you know, the faculty. Uh, Professor Payton, Dr. Oz, Dr. Archer, uh, Professor Grossman, they all helped me through my, throughout my journey. Um, I started off as an intern like everyone else in this panel, uh, like Anthony and Amber. And I worked with, with, with the OWTV News Club. Um, I started off as, as a regular intern, then I progressed into executive producer. And after that, Professor Payton got me into uh, ABC News as a regular teleprompter operator. It wasn't you know, what I wanted at first, but eventually I got the connections there and I, and I worked my way up to become a production assistant within a couple of months. Um, after that, you know, I just started working on di different shows from Good Morning America, Nightline, World News Now, um, just various people that I worked with throughout the business. And after that, I saw myself, I told myself I could do a lot more. And I saw like, you know, 
the potential that I have, I can, I can produce a lot more stuff with it. So I decided to move on and I moved on to CNN as an associate producer with Don Lemon. Um, so on his show, pretty much, uh, for, for, all, for those of you who have watched the show, we focus a lot about social justice, especially with everything that's going on right now, particularly, you know, uh, political climate, especially with, when it comes to race and everything that goes on within, you know, everything that goes on in, in the world. And a lot of that I really appreciate and I, and I um, have that experience, particularly having experience from being in Dr. Arthur's class, particularly in, you know, um, intro to African-American history. Uh, a lot of those aspects taught me and it also gave me a perspective in, in, in the stuff that I write for Don and the stuff that I produce for the different segments. So oh, great, so awesome, so awesome. Okay, so here's our next question. Uh, 2020 was a doozy for people of color, right? Particularly African-Americans. There was police brutality with the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter protests, the presidential elections and attempts to disenfranchise the vote, excuse me, the votes of black people and the pandemic that has devastated communities of color. How difficult has it been to cover some of these stories professionally without them affecting you personally? Um, Jackie? Um, it's been tough. My show, uh, New York Live, my shows, New York Live and The Hub Today, primarily focus on lifestyle and entertainment. But with everything that was happening in the world, it was important to me uh, and to the, you know, the producers of the show that we talk about what was going on in the world. And typically with the show, we do not do that. We kind of find a, a way to bring you joy and just focus on the good that's going on in the world. But this, these things that were going on, there was no way to do that and be authentic. And so it was tough because our show is very upbeat. And when we weren't talking specifically about Black Lives Matter or the pandemic, we had to be talking about pumpkin spice lattes or the <laughs> adoption week or, you know, talking to someone about um, an upbeat uh, comedy movie that they're in or TV series. And what I found with the, not just myself, but a lot of my colleagues that I talked to, whether they worked in entertainment or whether they worked straight on in news and, you know, was that it was taking a toll on us emotionally particularly those of us uh, that are Black American. And so it's been challenging. The great thing for me is that I have a great therapist mm -hmm. and I am also very transparent about these types of things. If you see me on an interview, if it doesn't get edited out, one of the first things that I ask the celebrities or, or any guests that I have is how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And they will you know, say how they're doing. And in turn, they'll ask me and I'm very honest. And I say, you know, I'm okay today. Or I'll say, well, considering all that's going on in the world, you know, I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm, I'm very intentional about being very open and honest about mental health. And I think in this business, it is easy to just kind of just produce a show or put, you know, or be on air or, you know, or edit and just move forward. And you're dealing with these kinds of things. Um, and a lot of people don't take into account the, the mental toll that that takes on, on folks. And you all may have seen, I can't, I'm going to remember, I'm going to forget her name. Um, it was a CNN reporter, um, Stanley, that was covering out in California, the recent spike um, in numbers. And she broke out in tears um, because she was covering so much death on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, if I could say anything to students, you know, that are, that are listening to this or watching this, particularly those who plan to go into news, you have to really find a way to check, to, to protect your mental health. Um, because you are covering, you know, death and negativity and destruction. There are days where I am lucky enough, and Stanley, you can't do this. I can turn off the news. I can step away from it. I don't have to watch it for day. All I have to do is research what I have to do for my interviews, you know, and that's it. You know, I can, I can tune in a little bit, maybe watch one newscast a day. But if I want to go a week without watching news, I have the luxury of doing that. Those who are in news, you cannot do that and do your job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's taken a tremendous toll. I have conversations almost, you know, two or three times a week with colleagues and friends who are suffering. And at my particular 
um, station, uh, WNBC in New York, we had an executive producer that committed suicide in January. Four <laughs> weeks later, we had a morning show reporter um, who died in her sleep. Uh, and then just today on a Zoom call I was on before this, found out that one of our, um, you know, the, one of the crew members of, of the show uh, had a heart attack and is not in good shape. And I had a coworker who called me a couple of weeks ago after the suicide of that executive producer. And she's a black woman. And she said, because of all the racial stuff that I have been dealing with at this company, she said, I just, I'm, I'm quitting. She said, I'm just gonna leave. I'm gonna move out to the West Coast and I'm just gonna start over. And, you know, I talked to her the other day and that she, she put in her notice. She's no longer working and she's selling her things and, and moving to the West Coast. And this is someone who I remember, you know, when I first met her, she would just walk in a room and her smile would light up the room. She would just exude such joy. You know, she was just so happy to be at work um, and just to be working in her profession. And now she's, she's, <laughs> she's done. And, um, you know, she wants to go into nonprofit, but she's done with media um yeah. in, in what she has been working in so i know that's a long answer but no it's, it, it's an honest answer right yeah it's very very challenging i'm a news head to you know i've had to do the same as you take you know pull away some days because it's it's trauma i mean that's yeah. the bottom line it's it's trauma okay mm -hmm. um i still want to hear briefly from um stanley and then selena on the same the same question um so i it's the same thing with me joy uh sometimes you can't mm -hmm. Jackie. Take off. I'm Jackie. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That sorry. happens all the time. So sorry. Um, it's the same thing. Sometimes I, I can't turn off, you know, some, when it comes to the weekend, I have to go to the point of turning off my email sometimes just to have at least maybe eight hours of good sleep. Because yeah. after watching that every day, especially with the COVID numbers, particularly that affects, disproportionately affects uh, Black people, it's very hard to, you know, go on the news and produce stuff like that every day and update those numbers. To me, those are not just numbers, those are actual people. Those are people who are loved ones. And it's, it's particularly hard to write those numbers every day because you've got to think about that. Every time you go to sleep, it's going, to be a new, it's going to be a new number every day. Not only that, but also everything that happened during the summer, uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, Rihanna Taylor, watching stuff like that and reporting to it on the news, it's hard to deal with sometimes because that could be me, that could be somebody I love, so like somebody who you know, I might not know, but that could be somebody I can, I can uh, walk across the street from. And you never know. It can, happen within, it can happen within an instant. George Floyd was killed for eight minutes and 46 seconds, something like that. And watching that and reporting that and replaying that video over and over and over again is traumatizing to the point sometimes well, there are times where I would have a mental breakdown after work because I, how, do you, how do you ingest that? And, and redirect that to, to the viewer saying, this is what's happening. This is the world that we live in. This is America. This, yeah. is, this is two stories. This is, this is a tale of two cities, pretty much. Black America and white America. And sometimes uh, working at ABC before I moved to CNN, um, trying to have that conversation with white colleagues sometimes can be difficult because you can express how you feel about that, but at the same time, they won't really understand what you're going through because Outside of work, I could be just a regular black man, and I could that that can happen to me within an instant. To them, you know, they can walk out of work and nothing happens. You know, there are times where sometimes I'd be walking to work at night when I used to work the overnight shift, I would be stopped by the police. This is when you know the protests were happening, and I would have to show them my ID. And a colleague who walked by within, let's say, two minutes after me, she wasn't stopped. And that to me sometimes is just going through that is very difficult, and you know. And it is, it is traumatizing. And for those of you who are entering the media, those of you people of color, it is very important sometimes to take breaks and to take care of yourself. Thank you. Selena? Yeah, you know, to Stanley's point, it's different as a journalist of color because you're not just reporting the news, you're living it. Um, before I get into my answer, I forgot to shout out Dean Edwards. So shout out to Dean Edwards, who's also watching. Um, so. I would say for me, when George Floyd happened, I remember that story. I remember that day. I, you know, 
we, I was editing a piece, one of our writers wrote it up and I watched that video without warning because it's before it really picked up. So I had no, I didn't get a trigger warning. I had no idea how traumatizing it was. I watched that video. I had a visceral reaction. I, I, I couldn't even, it was a lot for me. And, you know, from there, the next, obviously that triggered the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement of, across the globe. Um, so all of a sudden it was like a rabbit hole of videos of police killings, murders, and, you know, near death experiences that black people were having. And I remember like, I would wake up and I'm not like a phone addict, you know, I go on social media, I'm usually on and then off, but I was, you know, just going down that rabbit hole of video after video. And it was definitely affecting me, um, my mental health. I had to turn my phone off. And to Jackie's point, you're not really supposed to do that. I had to turn it off for eight hours one day, which was a lot because this was during my work hours. I couldn't take it because again, we're not just reporting it, we're living it. So when I see these videos, especially a black man, I see my father, I see my uncles, you know, I see my stepbrother, I see my cousins and stuff like that has happened in my family. So it, it's even more real. Um, I think that, you know, gratefully I work at, and for the most part of my career, I spent at black owned media outlets. So my experiences have been different. We, you know, we'll get on a Zoom call and we'll talk about, we'll have conversations like this. Um, you know, when I was speaking to my, my um, supervisor, you know, we speak very candidly about these experiences and how they're affecting us. So it, it is, I am grateful to be able to share those experiences with my colleagues. I can only imagine what it feels like to report on the news, to be emotionally invested in what's happening and there not have anybody there that can really empathize. That's hard to Stanley's point. So um, I forgot what the original question is, but no, that, that was my experience. You answered it. You answered it well. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, Amber, you have a question? Yeah. So this next question is in regard to the topics that are covered. Um, do you think it's difficult sometimes to get Black stories covered in mainstream outlets and not, and more specifically, positive stories? Or is there this agenda in media to sell Black tragedy? Any one of you can answer that if you. I um, think it, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was gonna say it is difficult. Um, you know, just over the years working, you know, when I was at BET, I did story, I, I did some work for CBS. I worked at CNN, just in, you know, I've worked in local news in various markets. There in, in every um, mainstream news outlet that I worked in and even now, covering entertainment the way that I do. Uh, it wasn't a challenge at BET, obviously, but everywhere else, it, it was and is always a challenge to get there to be a focus beyond ha Black History Month on, uh, you know, just every, you know, Black stories, stories about Black people or issues that are um, of interest to Black Americans. It is very difficult to get those stories to become just mainstream American stories. So it is challenging, particularly if you are um, a black American to work in a place like that, particularly if you're the only person. In, in my case, a lot of situations I was in, I was the only person. And you have to make a, cho a choice early in your career about how you are going to deal with that because you will have to deal with it unless you are working for a black media outlet. If you are not, chances are great that you will have to be the one to say, hey, why aren't we covering this story? Hey, why are we covering this story in this way? Hey, why are we covering black people in this way? And not just black people, brown people, people of all races um, that are not white. Um, it, it is very challenging. It is very frustrating um, because you have people who, you know, in the wake of a, you know, the death of the, the uh, of George Floyd and this racial awakening that people are all of a sudden realizing that oh, racism is an issue, and everybody wants to post up a black square, and now they want to do right by black people, and let's correct this. That if you watch closely, that was a moment, right? That was because I don't want to look like 
we don't want to look like we're not, we don't care. So we don't want to look like we don't cover these things. So a lot of people just threw a lot of stories out there. And then what, but what are they doing now? All those media outlets, what are they putting out there now? Beyond February, again, Black History Month is another, you know, that was just an extension of Black History Month. So it, that too can take a toll on your mental health. Because when you go in there and when something happens, you're going to be sitting there saying to yourself, oh, am I going to say something again today? Is it going to be me? <laughs> what am I going to say? Am I ready for, you know, it's like going in and, and having that fight. But I encourage all of you all, you know, students that are listening to take that on, you know, to you, you somebody has to say something. You can't be the one to just kind of say, well, let me just get my check and let me just get my experience and then I'm not gonna be here long anyway. You have to, you know, as, as John Lewis would say, you have to, you have to cause trouble good, and it's good trouble, mm -hmm. but you have to, you have to be the one that they, my coworkers to this day, I'll bring stuff up on a Zoom call and be like, oh, here she go again. <laughs> and I don't care. Cause yeah, here we go again. Do you know what I mean? You, but you have to, you have to take it up. You have to be the one that says something if no one else is going to say something. Right now, thank God, a couple of years ago, they hired another black person to be in my office space now. And she and I have become like this because of everything that the, like we talk before our meetings to say, are you gonna be the one? If she brings up something, I back her up automatically. If I bring up something, she's got my back with the yeah, Jackie's right, we do need to. <laughs> It's, it's it never it yeah. never it's never ending and it's not going to end in any of our lifetimes so right. we have to be willing to take up the mantle and and you know get in good trouble yes so Oz I was going to cut the question because Jackie covered it a little bit but I'm just going to revamp it and then Oz I'll give you another question um so this issue we're talking about right now does it have to do does it have to do with what white viewers want is there a divide like do white viewers just not have a taste to see, you know, things, Black culture and what affects Black people? And if so, how do we bridge that divide in, in the media? Selena, do you have a thought? Um, I mean, I think that's a very interesting question because uh, we've seen, you know, white people, white folks eat up Black culture when it comes to hip hop. <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, it, people can't get enough and that's just not even white Americans. You know, hip hop has been, you can argue hip hop has been appropriated around the globe, appreciated, appropriated, you know, that's up for debate. Um, so I think that it depends on things that suit them, I guess, or things that they find entertaining. Um, you know, there's something called, the word is slipping my mind, of trauma porn, or it's like, it's like some people actually like to see that type of violence you know, happening in real time, you know, people get off on that. So I get a very interesting question um, because that there is an appetite for a lot of things black oriented and black centered. Um, so, and I, so I've seen, I can see both sides of, of that question. Uh, Anthony? Perfect. Let's see. The next one we have here is what do you think is the biggest mistake by the media when covering issues of race? Uh, Stanley, would you like to start us off? Um, sure. Um, I think when it comes to covering race, particularly on different aspects, particularly a crime, we see that there's always a, 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 an association with a, a criminality with blackness a, uh, and also a tragedy and trauma to go off what Selena was saying pr previously. When you look at different aspects of, especially when it comes to like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor, um, Tamir Rice and all, all those other, other uh, young young people who were who were killed uh, um, by police, we always see that they're always digging into their past in terms of finding something criminal about them, and finding that, watching that every day and watching that constantly consuming that, they, it kind of puts a label on black people, saying they're they're the reason why they they had something happen to them is because they're they were doing something criminal, which is not true. And that's I think that's one of the major one of the major points that you know that I try not to you know incorporate when I'm writing certain certain stuff about you know uh, current events. And Don does the same thing. That's why me and Don and other producers we have this conversation every day. How do we not how do we not look at this lens? How do we not look at this issue through a certain lens? How do we bring the truth and bring 
what's actually right about this. And I remember also having this conversation with Dr. Archer's class that you know, there's always this constant fetish, I should say, with this trauma about Black people and just having this, you know, not, not having some type of triumph about them. And I think if you look at it, when it comes to Black History Month, a lot of these TV shows and movies, they're always based on trauma from Roots to The Help, the different like different movie titles like, you know, um, Boys in the Hood, they're all based on trauma. And I think we should re re revolutionize how we look at Black people as a whole because our history is not just trauma. We, we have a lot of triumph that we brought to this country and also different contributions. We should see more of my, uh, Dr. King's, more, look at Kamala Harris, the first Black female vice president. We should, we should see a lot more celebrations than rather than, than, uh, tr than uh, tragedies. I think that's, that's something that we should start off, like stop looking at uh, you know, Black people as, well as like a as a cesspool of tragedy. And can I chime in on that? Of course. We have time. I just yeah. want to quickly say too, um, to, to add to that, I think a, a huge problem um, when the new, with the news media specifically when it comes to covering Black stories, Black people, Black issues, is the lack of Black people in management. Uh, there are not enough Black people in decision-making um, positions. And listen, I I didn't want to go into management. There, it, it, you know, a lot of people don't want those jobs. Probably most people here either want to go into the production side of things or they want to be on air. You know, a lot of people are not on that management track. Um, and that is unfortunate because the, that's where the decisions are made at the end of the day, the day. And it's not just the news directors and general managers, but it's people in the sales, you know, on the sales team now. That factors into a lot of things too. I think that's the biggest mistake that the news media is making right now is the lack of diversity. And if I might be as bold to say a lot, just because someone is black and high ranking someplace, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are, as I like to say, black, black, because a lot of times white people will elevate black people that they feel comfortable with mm -hmm. and that they know will only go so far um, as far as far as, you know, being progressive and pushing for certain things. Um, so that is an issue. It's not just, you know, a lack of diversity in management, but then the people that are in there how willing are they to really go to the mattresses for the black community and push for what's right to the point that they're willing to risk their own comfort, not even their job, but a relationship, a comfort. You know, they're in the boardroom, so to speak, because they're going to play golf with this person or they're going to lunch with this person. They it's it's a it's a relationship, right? And if they're if they're not willing to um, you know muddy that up to make that an uncomfortable situation, then there's a problem. There's not change. So that's what I think is the biggest issue when it comes to the coverage. Right. All skin folk and your kin folk, as they say. That's what I wanted to say. Yes. <laughs> exactly that. It is very true in this business. It's it's unfortunate, but it's true. And people feel like if you're gonna make the work environment uncomfortable, they don't want to do it because people want to be comfortable. So yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. We don't learn yeah. that way, right? A lot um, of people that are, a lot of people of color who are in those diversity roles in certain companies are there, to me, are there for a reason in many cases. They were chosen because they were not going to really push for what is right for people of color. Exactly. Uh, so you want to ask the next question and maybe give it to Selena? Yes, of course. Um, I think, you know, we, we've been discussing, you know, around this question already, but what do you think, Selena, is the most crucial issue facing the people of color? Oh, sorry. We, um, can, can, I'm sorry. Can I, uh, I'm going to jump back one. Um, if it's, it's the one that was for me, I'm giving it to you, the sharing the favorite or impactful story. Oh, okay. Okay. That will work as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Selena, um, um, can you share one of your favorite or most impact, impactful stories when covering the issue of race? That I did? Yes. Um, um, hands down, I had a chance to spend some time in Tulsa. Now, this is before Regina King um, had that series and really you know, had that spotlight on what happened during the 1921 race massacre. 
So I went down, this is 2018. I went down to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma and, found, and got a history lesson beyond belief. I had no idea about what happened in 1921 where the original Black Wall Street um, was bombed, <laughs> like literally um, it was a, con a conspiracy of law enforcement officials, firefighters and KKK members that, you know, burnt this city down. Um, and there was still like, I think the last living survivor I, either may be alive or just passed. Um, so you have people who were there and, and, and were, were telling these stories, but the biggest thing that I learned was the conspiracy of silence around it. There was, you know, this is not in curriculum. Um, when I had a chance to speak to the mayor of Tulsa, who told me, who described himself as a historian and who said he didn't find out about the massacre until I think he was at least 28. And his grandfather actually participated in it he told me that his grandfather uh, was white, obviously, and was working to actually provide shelter for some of the refugees who were displaced. Like hundreds of people were killed, 10,000 were displaced from their homes um, and the city was left in ruins. So, you know, when I did that and I spoke to some of the, the young black millennial activists on the ground fighting to rebuild Black Wall Street, um, they, you know, the passion that they have you know, they wanted to get this issue out on a national level um, and to, for people to understand the history behind it and what they wanted to do. But there was also this generational divide where some of the, the older activists and older folks were saying, you know, what happened happened. They didn't seem as optimistic about rebuilding it, which I think is reflective of Black culture in itself. You know, I have, you know, my family members who are in the silent generation and some of the boomers, you know, they aren't as optimistic because they live through so much more. Um, so that story in itself, like besides what it did for our readers at Black Enterprise, um, it, it, it was just so eye-opening for me. So that was probably one of the most impactful stories on race that I did. That's great. Jackie, and then Jackie and then Stanley. I was going to say, I mean, there's just been, just because I worked at BET, you know what I mean? There, there have just been so many, I can't, I don't know if I could narrow it down to just one. I think there was a series that I did um, when I was at BET because, and I will say, and, and it was so long ago, but to be able to exist, um, as a journalist, as a news journalist in an atmosphere where you can cover stories from a, a, a Black American perspective, you know, as a, as a Black woman and not get any pushback about anything um, is such a luxury that I have not experienced since I left. Um, it, it was just a series that I did. It was a, a three stories that I did on the history of um, gospel music. And, you know, it's, in, you know, starting with, you know, slavery really coming from those African roots, you know, in the fields and just how it progressed over the years to what it is today. That was probably such um, an incredible experience for me. It is one of the stories that I'm most proud of today. Great. Stanley, do you have something you want to share? Yes. Uh, for me, it was, this is when I first started at CNN. Uh, with, uh, with Don Lemon is when we interviewed uh, George Floyd's family and also Jacob Blake's family. I think to be part of that was also an eye-opening view because we get to see how humane, you know, Black people, as I, as I was saying earlier, it's just, it's more than just trauma. You know, that these are actual people who are hurting and that message that we used and, and I, also, I also contributed to one of the questions that, you know, we asked both the families because we felt that, you know, having people like us on the producing staff would give us a different perspective for other for our viewers to understand that, you know, this is just more than a black issue. This is a human rights issue because this has been going on for far too long. And yeah. to contribute to that is is very impactful for me because I can say that I was a part of history because this movement reignited the way we the way we think about race and how we should move forward. Great, excellent. We have <clears throat> one last question before we open it to any of the audience who may have questions. Amber, you can ask your last question. 
the climate? Mm -hmm. So in regard to the, who's being hired, um, do you see more people of color being hired or what is the climate like specifically for black journalists? Um, we could start with um, Ms. Reed. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that it's changed much. I think that there's this whole, um, since George Floyd died and the whole, like I said, racial reckoning, I think a lot of people are, they just don't want to look bad. And so they're trying to make sure that they're covering black stories or they're, you know, there's a lot of promotion, you know, Stanley can speak to this at different news outlets, people are being promoted, you're seeing more black faces as hosts and things like that. That's all well and good. Um, but, you know, there's only a certain number of slots for host. Who's going to be correspondents? Who's producing? You know what I mean? Who are the associate producers? Who's getting the internships? Um, all of those things, Matt, who are getting hired as videographers? All of those things. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there has been a tremendous shift in that. Um, it, it just, I, I really don't think so. And I, I'd love to be wrong about it, but I have not heard about it. Selena? Sure. So, you know, again, my experience is very unique. However, I had recent conversations with Monique Chenault, the former showrunner at Access Hollywood, who is now working with Bill Packer to produce Central Ave. And I also had a conversation with LaShawn Browning, who is a showrunner at VH1's uh, Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. And she's done a lot of other work. They both told me that behind the scenes, there is a dearth of Black people in positions of power. They said, despite the, the, the people on, on, on camera, you know, we see way more diversity when it comes to these TV shows, but when it comes to the decision makers, those who determine what is greenlit and what is not, um, you know, those who determine the casting, um, the direction, line producing, all of that, they said it is scarce. You know, it is very, you know, few and far between. And I had a chance to speak to, you know, both of these Black women who are, who managed to become showrunners of very popular shows and series. Um, and, you know, their journey is almost an anomaly because it's not reflective of what's going on in the industry at all. Okay. And uh, Stanley? Uh, and I, I also agree with Selena and Jackie that sometimes it might look good on screen, but behind the scenes, it's not really diverse as they wanted to make it seem. They just had a, a new race and equity department that they just opened up uh, with CNN, but at the same time, we're not really fully covering black stories. Like again, like I said, it's mostly just continuous like trauma of black people. And also myself included, I am one of the only black producers on the show right now. Um, the other two people are, are production assistants and they're, they're two women, but they tend to not have enough, you know, um, participation. And I, and I try to advocate for them because it's, I feel like it's more important, especially with Don. He's somebody who is very inclusive and it comes, when it comes to like topics like this, we would like to have everybody included in conversation. And the, the, the practice of not having enough people of color behind the scenes is very discouraging sometimes. And that's also part of the reason why I left ABC News I would see, you know, interns coming and going. A lot of the black interns would not be coming back or they wouldn't be hired back for, you know, the next intern cycle um, or the production assistants would leave and they would not come back. Um, me, myself, I, I saw that there weren't really a lot of black stories going around when it comes to, you know, production meetings and having conversation about stuff like this. And I told myself, you know what, maybe this is not the best place for me because one of the things that, one of my mentors told me currently at CNN, she told me that your ideas is your currency. But I said, at the same time, your career is also your investment. It's finding the right place to put your currency in. And I felt like ABC News wasn't that right place. And don't get me wrong, it's a, it is a great company. But for me, I don't think it would, it would it helped me grow as a person or as a journalist. And I felt like I, I needed to move. So that's why I found myself at CNN. Um, right now, we, we, have, we do have a lot more diverse anchors and you know, on-screen uh, hosts but there needs to be a lot more black producers and showrunners. Very good, thank you. Anthony? 
Yes, thank you so much for uh, all of you for um, really giving us a lot of those beneficial and valuable lessons to really take into consideration when we moved into the media industry. Um, for, so now we would like to open the discussion for our audience. You know, we'll start going through the questions within the chat box and we'll start going through as many as we can. And, and then we'll go from there. Do we have any? Are there any questions in the chat? I can't see. <laughs> is anybody, we can open it up to, does anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Well, we have 40 some odd people on here. <laughs> oh, somebody said, yes, I do. Terry, Terry, Phoebe. Uh, yeah, hi, um, my name is Terry Phoebe. Um, uh, my uh, question that I do have for you guys being that um, you guys are African-Americans in uh, mm -hmm. the media industry, um, uh, what is your biggest fear? Um, being that you know, you're surrounded by uh, people who don't really understand not only you, but the culture. What is your biggest fear being someone um, in media? That there's not enough time and there's not enough energy behind making a change, putting the, you know, covering the stories that need to be covered, getting people of color, particularly black people, the information that they need in order to improve their lives as a whole. Um, being able to authentically be ourselves and tell our stories without having to play any games when we're working in mainstream media. Like that is my biggest fear that there's just not enough time and there is just not enough momentum behind making a real shift in this industry. Um, and, 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 you know, and just pushing for significant change. It's just, it's just so slow and just, you know, it's annoyingly slow to me. And that is my biggest fear that, you know, it, there just won't be big enough change in time. Okay. Um, Naila, you have a question? I do. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, how, um, how do you guys go about fighting back um, or challenging things that you think um, are wrong or not being done correctly without seeming aggressive or uh, disrespectful mm -hmm. in your perspective? I think sometimes, um, oh, sorry, Selena, you can go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Stanley. Um, I think sometimes you just have to keep pushing. That's something that I think there's no other, there's no, I feel like they should not compromise, especially for black women. You know, you should, you, you deserve, for your, your voice to be heard. And I feel like we should we should keep pushing for that narrative to go out that things need to change. Look, look at what we did this year with this past presidential, past presidential election. We got a black woman into the, into the vice presidency. If we can do that, we can change that narrative. And I think there is no such thing as compromise anymore. There's no, there's no more time or space for that. This is not the 1960s, this is not the 1950s. This is, this is the 21st century and things need to change. And I feel like th that, that, that's the only, that's the only um, answer to that is to keep pushing. Regardless, if we get knocked down, we get back up and we keep pushing. And that's what I, what's, uh, I've been doing as a producer. And that's what Don is doing as an anchor is to keep pushing. A lot of people might not like him for it, but we got, we got that conversation out. It's a hard, it's hard conversations to have, but it needs, it needs, to, it needs to be you know, had in, in, in this current climate. And I would just add Nala, um, one of the strategies that's really helped me is writing out my arguments and then coming with data and, you know, removing emotion um, and just sticking to the facts um, when it comes to, I don't know what it is that you're fighting for, but if you're pushing for a story that you know in your heart deserves the coverage and will give exposure, you know, the argument is, well, it will, you know, speak to this demographic that we're not, you know, connecting enough with, you know, you can say that obviously if it has some type of connection or revenue that will also help um, you to win an argument. But I would just say, stick to the facts, remove the emotion. Um, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be emotional because it's not, um, but I would just say that sometimes it's easier for, pe for you to communicate and for the other people to hear you when you just present it in a way um, that extracts the emotion and just, you just give an argument. Jackie? Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it can, it, it's hard to remove the emotion from it, but it is important to find a way or 
to have that emotion at the appropriate time. Um, I think, yes, it is important to have your facts together, to have as much research or resources to back up your argument, whether you're pushing a story or pushing for change. Um, you know, for me, you know, particularly I had an incident at, at my current job where we cover the Golden Globes red carpet and for, you know, the, the, we haven't done it the past couple of years, but because of COVID and then because of football, um, but my co-host, um, who is a white woman would always be the one who would lead the show. And I, you know, I, I, I kind of let it go for a while, but then I felt like, well, there seems to be no concrete reason for this. Let me go and, you know, and kind of find out what's going on here and make an argument for me to be the lead. But I had to go and do my homework. I had to come with a, an argument, you know, and support for that argument to do it. So it just, it really depends because sometimes you're gonna get to the point where you're so fed up and emotional <laughs> about it. It's gonna be hard not to bring emotion to the table, but even in those instances, you wanna have your facts. You wanna have the support to make an argument. It's unfortunate because everybody won't have to do that, but you will, but it's not fair, life's not fair. It is what it is. You can't, you know, uh, rest on that. But you do have to have your facts together and you just have to kind of pick and choose when to leave your emotions out of it because sometimes emotion will go a long way. Not, you know, and in news, you know, we're all on a first name basis. It's like a different kind of atmosphere. There's a lot of emotion in news anyway. I've heard a lot of people yell and, you know, and do things like that. Not saying that you should do that in, in these instances, but it's just kind of case by case. It depends on what you're making an argument for, what you're pushing for, and then what kind of evidence you have to back up where you stand on that. That would be the best way I can see it after making arguments for so many things over the years. I mean, it's just, it, it is an unfair industry. It just is what it is, particularly if you're black, even double so if you're a woman. So you got to be ready to fight. I mean, I've had to bring, I had to call people MFs in order to get paid, <laughs> you know, so it, and that's, that's real that, I mean, it, it, it is, you know, so it, 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 and then there are times where I've been like, if you check this email here, then the, it just depends on who you're dealing with and what the situation is. It's case by case. All of it, it also could, could help to try to rally around some support. Like if you can get others um, to support you and then you bring that argument to a decision maker that helps yeah it's all exhausting it is just exhausting people don't understand the fatigue that you know goes you know it just builds up and then that's when you end up exploding um we have another question from another student deborah do would you like to do that on camera deborah no okay uh so maybe read it for her anthony do you see it? Sure. So uh, she would like to ask you all, uh, how did you figure out what part of media production you wanted to pursue as a career? How do you find a mentor? And is it wrong to ask someone you admire to be your mentor? Jackie, why don't you start? Since I know this is something dear to your heart. I know. I love that there were multiple questions. I love that <laughs> right off the bat. I, you go for it. You go for it. <laughs> um. I think that for me, I thought I wanted to go into print. I thought I wanted to be a magazine writer, um, but after an internship at a newspaper, I realized that that was not what I wanted to do. And so fortunately I had another year left in school and I poured all that into focusing on broadcast media. And I, I realized at that point, I wanted to be a news journalist. After working in news for a while, I realized that it was too exhausting and mentally draining on my spirit. And so I moved into entertainment, um, which can also be exhausting, <laughs> but it, it is what it is. You know what I mean? I do love working in media. I guess you have to kind of figure out A, what you're going to wake up and enjoy, do what you're passionate about, but also be what you're good at. A lot of people may want to be on camera. Everybody can't be on camera. A lot of people may want to be a producer. 
everybody's not good at producing organizational skills and things like that. Yes, if you put in the work, you can definitely get there. I don't like to discourage anyone from anything, but listen, I want to be a singer to this day. It ain't happening. You know what I mean? It's just not going to happen. So sometimes you have to kind of say, is this the right path for me? As far as finding a mentor, I think when you're a student, I think it is good to just be bold and not to be easily discouraged. People who are professionals are very busy. And then we're in the middle of a pandemic. People have personal things going on. If you reach out to someone, they don't get back to you. Do not take it personally. Keep persisting. Keep pushing. Figure out. And, and to me, finding a mentor is not only, you know, it's not, oh, I'm grateful to you for being my mentor. It's also, what are you going to get out of it? Connect with someone who you can relate to, who is going to give you valuable advice and feedback, and who is going to have time for you. You know, you may want Michelle Obama, for example, to be, you know, I'm just pulling the name out of the hat, <laughs> to be your mentor. She doesn't have the time for it. And unless you're, you know what I mean? So people want to always go for people with really big names. You know, let's take Don Lemon, you know, who I love. We're good friends. You know, Don, you know, does not have time to mentor each and every person that he meets. He may want to do it, but does he have the time to, I can tell you from being friends with Joy Reid, people who are hosting the cable news shows, that is a thankless job. It is a sun up to sundown kind of situation. They don't have a lot of time to do mentoring. So find people that aren't necessarily, you know, the, the biggest names in the industry, a lot of producers, people who are behind the scenes, always, not always, but often make the best mentors in, in my book. Okay. Um, very quickly, either one of you want to say anything to that, Selena? To the I think Jackie nailed it. Okay. Everything for me. We have um, one other question. Uh, Kurt, do you want to give your question or would you like us to read it? Um, I could get my question. Okay, great. Um, so my question was, are you able to come up with your own narratives in your career or are you often handed a narrative from your superiors? And if you are handed them, are you able to incorporate your own perspective into those narratives? Mm. I think it depends on uh, what position you're pretty much, you know, in. As a, from a producing standpoint, it's sometimes the other way around depending on what kind of producer you are, let's say you're an anchor producer, sometimes you you, uh, you you collaborate with your anchor and it sometimes it goes up to, you know, the executive producer or whoever's in charge of programming, stuff like that. It's not it's not all the same for it's for every network. It can be different for ABC, MSNBC and stuff like that. But from a producing standpoint, sometimes you can have your ideas and sometimes it gets shot down, but that's just how it is. It's just the business. Um, I think Jackie can go along more from the anchoring perspective, I think. Yeah, unless Selena, you wanna jump in first cause I feel like I just talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I would I would just say like, it really depends. I think that for me in my career because I've carved out such a distinct voice, if anything is this assigned to me, it's because they want my perspective and they want my voice at this point in my career. So, you know, I've been grateful to work with um, superiors and, you know, those who have seen and identified my strengths and have used it to the advantage of the company. So it's worked in my favor. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna do one last question. Um, I see Shamar has a question. Shamar, do you wanna be on camera or do you want me to read it? Okay, so I'm gonna read the second part because we answered the first part already. What mistakes did you make early in your career that have helped you grow? It's a great question. Because <laughs> we all, we, people think that, you know, successful people don't make mistakes, I think. So is there any mistake that sticks with you that made you better because you never made that mistake again? Yes, and I tell this story a lot. Um, three weeks after graduation, I ended up getting an interview at CNN, which at the time was my dream job. And I bombed it. And the reason why, you know, hindsight being 2020, 
you know, when I look back, graduating from a Westbury after receiving the Chancellor's Award, receiving the President's Medal, and also, you know, speaking at graduation, I was on a high. And that came with a level of entitlement that I took for granted. And I almost thought, you know, being, you know, even just being an upperclassman, you, you know, you're already at the top of the totem pole. And then as soon as you hit the real world, you come crumbling down to the bottom. And, you know, I didn't realize that. So I didn't even realize how big of a deal it was to even get an interview at CNN three weeks after graduation. I, I ended up, you know, meeting Deborah Fayek. I think that's her last name. She's, I think she's still there. Um, and she, you know, helped me out a lot. And then the reason why I did not do well was because I was not prepared. Um, you know, didn't do enough. I don't even know. If I did research, definitely not enough. Um, you know, I didn't, and when I say research, not just behind the company, but like how to ace an interview, how to present yourself, how to deliver, all of that comes into play. Um, and you can't just walk in and, and, you know, just show up. So completely bombed it was hysterical. Learned a huge lesson because success equates, the, the way people become successful, it's opportunity meets preparation. If you don't have one of those two things, you can, your dream, the door to your dream job can open up right now and you won't get it. You need both to really succeed at it, even if you do get it. So I never did that again. I learned and, and figured out, you know, the strategy behind uh, a good interview um, and what it takes to actually prepare. And I will say maybe six to seven years later, I finally got another interview at CNN. I got an offer and I turned it down. So you're gonna make mistakes, but turn those mistakes into lessons. Okay, great. Um, I know we're running, we've ran over 10 minutes so far, but um, unless do you guys either have Stanley or Jackie, or if not, I have one individual question for you both. Do you want to speak to that this current question, Jackie, or are you? No, I'll take the individual question because I do have to go. Okay, that's fine. And then we'll go because we're running over for everybody. Um, I'm just going to ask you guys. I know other people were slated to ask you, but OSB is one of the most diverse colleges in the country. And we know you went to Clark Atlanta, HBCU. We want to know how do you feel going to HBCU has prepared you for your career, your current career? Hmm, I would say going to an HBCU prepared me in so many ways because A, I grew up in Atlanta, which already gives you a certain amount of confidence as a Black American. You know, for as long as I can remember, there's been a Black mayor in, in Atlanta, right? You grow up around that. There's so much of you know, Black affluence around you, Black-owned businesses, long-standing Black-owned businesses. So there's not just like one neighborhood um, that is known, you know, as an African-American neighborhood in Atlanta. There are countless all over the place. Not to say that there's not racism, uh, but that's met with that side of things. You know, there is not just Clark Atlanta University, but there's Morehouse and Spelman and Morris Brown. And, you know, there's that whole atmosphere that I grew around, um, you know, growing up. And so going, you know, I, as a little girl, I used to go to Spelman, you know, for, for dance classes and things like that. But anyway, um, and that made me want to go to an HBCU. And it equips you with something that is very unique. Um, relationships that I still have to this day with professors and, um, you know, student for, you know, fellow students who are now colleagues in the in the industry. And there's an intimacy with the professors wanting to see you do well and going the extra mile to help you that gives you the confidence that you need um, once you get out. Because I went from Clark Atlanta University to Northwestern um, for graduate school. And in that atmosphere, I was only one of two Black people um, in my class. But going to Clark Atlanta University, it equipped me with the confidence that I needed to exist in that space um, and feel like I belonged in that space, to not feel inferior or let anyone, any of my uh, white counterparts' um, entitlement 
interfere with my ability to thrive because it you will come up against that and I feel like going to an HBCU really helped me in that way and so many other ways to compete and strive and stand strong in this industry because this industry is very challenging yes it is it is and you guys you already spoke about Oh, Westbury, any parting words about how important it was? And then we're going to sign off because it's we're running out. But either one of you guys, if you have anything to say about how Old West has, you know, prepared you for where you are. I think what I would say to the students is do, do not be discouraged. I know with this current climate with COVID and, you know, everything that's going on, reach out, reach out to professors. Uh, even to this day, Professor Payton still calls me every week or every other week. This Stop is, telling on me. <laughs> That's, that's the beauty of going to Old West because you will always have a community to, to back you up. They will always push you to do go to the, the highest heights. Even Professor Oz, before I left, you know, he gave me words of encouragement and I still remember them to this day. Any, anything that you put your mind to, you will achieve as long as you put the effort in. And like I said earlier, your, your ideas are your currency, but you got to find the right place to put your currency in, in order to have a big investment. Mm. Oz, I know you wanted to say something to Stanley. Do you want to say it? And then I'll get Selena. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, it, it was just personal to me. You know, my relationship with, you know, Stanley is a little bit different. Three mm -hmm. years ago, when I started my job at Old Westbury, when I was walking slowly and trying to understand where I'm going in the, you know, uh, hall, and I found out the TV studio and there was this student sitting there, you know, doing some editing, you know, figuring out things. And that student, like, looked at me strangely who that person is kind of a thing like this is the first time we are meeting so it was you know it no that was Stanley of course and then <laughs> you know we built up that relationship and you know I just want to you know it was so um, great seeing you here with awesome. all these great and intellectual minds together I <laughs> so you know we are all so proud of all of you but uh, Stanley is a little bit different for me so I just <laughs> Okay, Selena, and then we'll go. Yeah, I think um, Jackie and Stanley left us with great inspirational parting words. I'll leave a tangible one I wish that I knew when I was a student. Um, for me, my experience, it's easier to land an internship in media than it is a job. So try, like, if you know where you want to work, let's say you have five or six different networks of publications, try to get an internship now kill it and then try to you know turn that internship into a paid position okay, great thank you okay anthony close this out all right that concludes today's conversation with black media professionals we'd like to thank each and every one of our panelists for having such a great talk here with us let's give them a hand clap <laughs> thank you guys <laughs> And we also like to thank our advisors for helping making this event happen. And lastly, thank you all for attending today. I'd like to pass it over to Amber. Um, again, thank you to our panelists for coming and thank you all for attending. Please make sure to follow us on social media. And until next time, enjoy the rest of your Black History Month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This ends our program. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me.